thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, The Benefits of Green Shores to Project Start to Finish, hosted by DG Blair and Kelly Locke. My name is Kate Murphy, and I'm also joined here with my colleague, Jim Vanderwall, who's on this webinar as well. This webinar is hosted as a part of the BC Regional Adaptation Collaborative, which supports local governments, First Nations and industries in integrating climate change adaptation into their planning and decision making. We also have a portal for adaptation resources, which you can find on retooling.ca. This is a snapshot of the retooling.ca website. And in the upper left, you can see where you can subscribe to our newsletters, which gives out adaptation resources, news and funding opportunities. And in the bottom right, you can see where you can access previous webinars that have been recorded and posted online. And this webinar will also be recorded and posted online and I'll send out an email to all of the attendees so that you guys know when that happens. Just a quick uh, announcement before we go on about the Adaptation Canada 2020 conference to be held on February 19th to 21st, 2020 in Vancouver. The Fraser Basin Council is coordinating this and it will bring experts and leaders from diverse sectors, regions and jurisdictions to work on one of the most urgent issues of our time, how to build climate change resilience. Please do mark your calendar now and feel free to sign up for email updates at the link that's provided there on the screen. And uh, we'll send out more news on the conference program and early bird pricing and other relevant items. A few logistics before we go on. Please do keep your audio muted just so that we don't get any feedback on the call. If you have any questions, you can type them into the control panel. As you see on this image, there's a question box where you can ask your questions. Feel free to ask all throughout the webinar, but um, we're gonna be doing the Q&A session at the very end. So we'll just, we'll come back to them then. Um, and if you'd like to ask it verbally rather than type it, feel free to type in the question box that uh, you have a question to ask verbally. If you have any technical difficulties, you can put these in the question box as well, um, and Jim will answer them for you, or you can email us at FraserBasin at gmail.com. So we are joined by two wonderful speakers today, the first of whom is DG Blair, the Executive Director for the Stewardship Centre for BC. As the Executive Director of the Stewardship Centre for BC since 2010, DG Blair provides strategic leadership and facilitation of SCBC's collaborative initiatives, including green shores, stewardship practices for wildlife and species at risk, and strengthening stewardship proje projects. She has also co-authored numerous publications on green shores. A member of NRCAN's Coastal Management Working Group, she manages the Green Shores Local Government Working Group in BC and provides program oversight on bringing green shores to more communities here in BC and beyond. Our second speaker is Kelly Locke. Kelly Locke is a registered professional forester in British Columbia with a background in forest hydrology, timber supply review, and forest inventory. She has an MSc in forest science focusing on hydrology from the University of Alberta. She's working with the Stewardship Centre of BC as a Green Shores Projects Coordinator, helping to track all phases of Green Shores for homes and Green Shores for coastal development projects in BC, all the way from project initiation stage through to certification and posting of case studies on the SCBC website. I do hear a little bit of feedback, so there's likely someone that hasn't muted their audio. Um, if you could please mute it, then that would be great. Okay, that sounds wonderful. Kelly has completed Green Shores Level 1, Green Shores Level 2, and Green Shores for Homes Verifier courses. Thank you both so much for being here today. If you have any questions or follow up afterwards, please feel free to reach out to Jim Vanderwall or myself. Um, you can use the information on the screen right now. And if you need it later, feel free to go to Fraser Basin Council website and look us up on there. And with that, I will pass it over to you, DD. Okay, fantastic. Uh, when we try this go? Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks very much, Kate, for um, providing this opportunity into the Fraser Basin Council. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the benefits of Green Shores to projects start to finish. 
Green Shores is a program of the Stewardship Center for British Columbia, and the Stewardship Center's mandate is to strengthen ecological stewardship in BC by providing educational, technical, and capacity programs and resources to organizations, governments, the private sector, and the general public through collaborative partnerships. So what will we cover today? Uh, we're going to introduce you to the Green Shores program, including its rationale, benefits, and application. Share some lessons learned uh, from two Green Shores projects, including design, construction, and certification process. And as Kate mentioned, we will be having time for question and answers um, after following uh, both uh, Kelly and my presentation. So what is Green Shores? Um, it's a rigorous standard to preserve or restore shoreline physical processes. It's also about maintaining or enhancing habitat function. It's to prevent or reduce pollutants from entering the aquatic environment and to avoid or reduce cumulative impacts. And um, at this time, we'd like to have a, a quick poll about what you think are the most significant barriers to implement implementing um, Green Shores projects uh, from your perspective. So while the um, Organizer is uh, let's see, having the poll come up. So it's going to come up. Okay, and I'll move on to the next slide. Okay. And Kate, will you um, give us the results of that? that poll? Yeah, for sure. So it looks like what people believe is the most significant barrier is the lack of knowledge of green shores, number one at about 48%, and cost as number two at 31%. Perfect. Okay, moving moving on. Oh, let's see. For some reason, my screen is now frozen. If you click on your PowerPoint, DG, does that help? Never had this one happen before. Uh, pause. Let me click on that one. No, I'm going to unclick on that. Sorry about this, folks. Um, hmm. Not sure why. Let me just escape and I'll just. Uh, oh dear, now I'm totally frozen. Okay, I can. If this continues, I can load up the PowerPoint on my computer and just go as you tell me to. Sorry about this. Let me just see if I can get this working again. There we go. Hey, talking about challenges. <laughs> <laughs> so we do have some shoreline challenges. Um, and it's where we, uh, as uh, people who love to live and work and play on the shore, we do things like uh, uh, put um, houses way too close to the top of uh, bluffs and then remove vegetation and then have slumping like the pho uh, photograph we see on the left hand side. We tend to put in way too many docks um, where, rather than uh, collaborating with our neighbors so that we limit the impacts of docks. It's similar to the upper right hand uh, photograph, we put in fill and remove vegetation and then uh, have a, a shoreline erosion problems. We put in seawalls like on the lower right, uh, which really impact uh, coastal processes and also have tremendous Im impacts on the upshore, as you can see with this uh, overtopping of that wall on the lower right. And then we also do things like put in groins, which uh, changes the sediment uh, movement and water movement along the shore, which um, can in effect uh, starve a beach like you see on the right-hand side of that photograph uh, in the lower left there. So Green Shores is, has been created to support um, coastal, um, both lake as well as marine shorelines, uh, because functioning uh, shorelines are really vital to our most iconic species. The uh, healthy shore supports uh, forage fish, 
which then support the um, salmon, which then will um, enable uh, the orca, like we see at the on the right-hand side of the screen, um, to to survive. And Greenshore's designs strengthen that food chain. So, what are the program components? The first is um, the development of guidance materials that have been created so that uh, properties can um, function in a shore-friendly way. And both are built on a format similar to Built Green and LEED using a credit and rating uh, system to maximize and incentivize the number of best management practices that go into any uh, one shoreline project. We also realize that education and training is vital to expand awareness and use of the, the Green Shores guidance materials. The other part of it is um, research reports and resources. So the Stewardship Center uh, works with our funding uh, and collaborative partners to deliver uh, research report and, and resources. And I'll just draw your attention to the Greening Shorelines to Enhance Resilience Project Report as well as the Shoreline Policies and Bylaw um, document, which are both on our website, uh, greenshores.ca. And right now we're um, supported by Na um, Natural Resources Canada for uh, supporting nature-based solutions for resilience, which will be completed in 2020. So the project results will be offered then. We also have a Green Shores for Local Government Working Group where we offer facilitation and technical support to communities who are interested in increasing the number of Green Shores uh, policies and practices in their community. And then finally, which we'll be dealing with um, in diving into and more um, on this webinar, Green Shores Project Certification. So what does it look like actually getting a project uh, certified? I wanted to speak just briefly about Greenshore's training. Um, one of the things we realized that we need to increase uh, training opportunities, especially for professionals who are providing guidance to um, project proponents. And we currently have field-based uh, level one and level two courses, which are offered through the University of Victoria. And we recognize that everybody can go to a field-based course, particularly for the introductory one. So we're in development of an online level one course through um, British Columbia Institute of Technology, as well as development of a cohort-based training course uh, for approved professional designation. So that way we can work uh, in offering these courses, um, both um, the online courses um, actually nationwide. So that's, uh, wanted to highlight that. And if you, you can get more information about training, um, if you go to our website and sign up for our newsletters. So let's dive into Green Shores for Coastal Development. It's applicable to parks, mixed use residential uh, and commercial, and uh, institutional uh, projects. Uh, right now it is for marine shorelines only, but in an update we're completing in 2019, lake shores will be included as well. So just to give you an idea of what uh, the level of specificity within the guidance documents are, if you'll take a look here on, on number two, the, de the designated area for site design with the conservation of the shore zone the area must have an average of 30 meters or greater and a minimum width of 7.5 meters at any given point. So the idea here is that you can verify whether or not that um, the project either meets the design standard or not. However, we recognize that not all projects are, are the same. So different, the different designs, um, you get different points for that particular credit. So for example, in an urban park, you'll get one point. However, because a conservation area with limited public access and we have uh, enhancement of uh, native vegetation, you'll get three points for that credit. So the increase in the amount of conservation value, habitat value, you get more points. And this way we incentivize projects which have um, higher levels um, uh, achieving those Green Shores principles. Green Shores for Homes, um, again, it's a credit and rating uh, system applicable to residential properties because, of course, the cumulative impact of, of um, Lakeshore Homes residential properties is significant. So it is uh, applicable to both lake and marine shorelines, 
and it's intended to um, encourage incremental improvements. Here's an example of um, the point, uh, the credit for woody material. And um, again, we recognize that not all uh, properties are the same. So where woody material already occurs, you can get a base point of three, provided that um, it's on a minimum of 50% of the length. And, um, and you do not disturb that 80% of what's there. Uh, however, there are some places where we do not have the woody material, so then you can get one point per 10% per of improvement. So again, you can measure uh, the change as a result of that project. So what about the certification process? So how does that actually work? So the first is that a project, uh, hopefully, well, they would hear about Green Shores and they would enroll the project with, with uh, the Stewardship Center for BC and initiate the process. So what, what does that entail? Basically, uh, contacting the Stewardship Center and then with um, Green Shores for Coastal Development, there is a ver um, an enrollment fee of $300. Uh, Green Shores for Homes, thankfully, the, um, the enrollment fee is covered by uh, uh, grant funding uh, that we currently have, so there is no fee for that. That is free. So once the project is enrolled, we would send you uh, information for whichever um, type of project you have and assign a verifier. So you'll get the guidance materials, the template for um, tracking your project, and uh, assign assignment of a verifier. In stage two, you use the guidance material provided to design your project, and then while the project is being constructed, you collect the documentation required for your submittal in stage three. In stage three, you submit the project um, documentation. The verifier, uh, once uh, so that's when the project is completed, and then the verifier will then uh, review the material and, and do a site visit. Uh, and provided that you've met, uh, provided adequate information, documentation, the, verif the verifier will then verify the project um, that it meets the standard and assign a credit rating. And now we'll um, do a quick poll question of where do you think the most uh, Green Shores projects are located? Okay, so the poll is now open. And while that, you guys are, give you a minute to come up with that. And then we'll move on to, uh, you want to share the poll results. So it looks like the majority of people believe that the most Green Shores projects are completed on Vancouver Island. And DG, you can share with us whether or not that's correct. And that is correct. Well done, everybody. Vancouver Island, that's great. <laughs> um, so let's dive into taking a look at um, one uh, Green Shores project. And this one did not happen on Vancouver Island. This is a Green Shores for Coastal Development project, which happened in uh, the city of Vancouver and the shoreline habitat restoration project. So as you can see, the project location is right near the second Narrows uh, Bridge. And I'll give you another closer up, um, taking a look at the project. So this is New Brighton Park. It was, um, prior to being a park, it was an, a, an industrial area. And as you can see on um, this uh, aerial photograph that the majority of the park is, uh, is grass and an open area and the area outlined in red here is the project um, area within the park. So uh, what uh, are the project um, objectives? They were basically to restore the coastal wetland habitat by restoring that tidal influence that had been um, cut off when the, the area had been uh, filled in for this industrial activity. They wanted to increase the overall ecological function of the area. It had been identified as being a critical site for juvenile salmon, uh, chum, and chinook, as well as a resting area for uh, shorebirds. 
uh, Hasting Creeks uh, comes through that area. It was, um, they wanted to daylight it and uh, create that connection between uh, the area in um, New Brighton Park and, and Creekway Park. Then they also wanted to create uh, and restore the salt marsh, mudflats, tidal channels, beach grass meadows, and, and shrub areas with native species. They identified early on that uh, an increase in public use and education uh, about uh, this coastal area and the value of that habitat was, um, was key. So they installed uh, features such as picnic tables and viewing decks, as well as educational signs. They also recognized they, they and because the rest of the park was, was is very open, they didn't uh, and there's access to sh to shoreline elsewhere. They wanted to limit um, access to the newly restored uh, habitat. As you can see by this next slide, um, the project team was extensive, uh, and I don't have time to get into the the various roles, but. Um, Key leads were the, the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority and the Vancouver Parks Board who worked together to assemble and coordinate that project team uh, as well as the construction. They coordinated all the public and First Nations consultation and did all the permitting. In terms of other team members, um, we had a civil and coastal engineer, landscape architect, environmental consultants, the construction contractor, um, and the, the verifier and uh, the stewardship center as, as well to provide the, the sort of through the certification process. So let's talk a little bit about some of the, the key features of the design. So here you can see, um, if you think of that, old, uh, that uh, previously outlined area that I showed you in that uh, previous slide, we've got um, what they did was they took out the riprap here and restored um, access um, of the tidal influence in two places here and here. Uh, they created a habitat island um, in, in the middle and then did the contouring of uh, this area here uh, after removal of uh, contaminated soils. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, and then had the upland riparian area and here you can see the beach grass meadow in all parts of the area. They have a salt marsh area as well as a mud flat, and then you can see the channel. And in terms of the uh, restoration of the access for the upland area, you can see that um, area here for the creek. So let's take a look from photographs um, what this site looked like. Uh, you can see the this is the project area here. It had an old tennis court and, and not really much in the way of riparian vegetation prior to project construction. Here we have um, the initial stages where they did have to do the remediation of, of the soils and you can see that process um, underway in, in this uh, photograph. Um, here we are uh, partially through the construction process. Um, we have the Habitat Island has now been created and in this um, at this time they're they're working to um, start getting ready for a riparian planting over on this side and again here is the access um, to the to the creek the upland creek or the, uh, the creek there. And finally um, this is post construction. You can see that riparian area now here is um, Fully, fully vegetated. And um, in terms of the salt marsh uh, features, this, these areas here, it looks um, a, little, a little different. Um, and this is to prevent the geese from uh, snacking on all those newly planted, uh, uh, the vegetation here in the salt marsh. So those are stay, will stay until the uh, project, until the plants are um, grown up enough so that they will not be impacted by the by the geese. Um, in terms of key features, you can see the um, the pathways here, viewing platforms, um, and um, this is this really nice um, meadow and a riparian area here. So let's take a look um, at how the project rated. As you can see here from this slide, um, from all the different, the 11 different credits, possible credits, 
they achieved um, points in all but one. Um, of significance is the Climate Adaptation Plan, the Rehabilitation of Coastal Habitat, um, and um, I'll dive into a little bit more detail also on credit, uh, credit, credit 11. So in terms of rehabilitation of coastal habitat, they um, really increased the uh, um, amount of habitat uh, from a pre-project number of 137 meters uh, to uh, a post-project of 309 meters. And they did that by creating all this um, shoreline um, by creating this tidal, uh, this tidal area. They achieved a maximum points for that credit of four um, by that creation of that um, habitat island and the, all that extensive uh, riparian. And this novel uh, coast, coastal marsh habitat restoration. They get uh, points for removing a pre-existing riprap in this, these two areas here and then on the, on the other side as well. And they really had a very robust um, habitat rehabilitation plan. And all this led to this um, this maximum um, this maximum of points for that credit. I wanted to also mention their outreach and education. Um, as previously mentioned, they had a very extensive public and stakeholder engagement, and they also worked um, extensively with um, multiple partners, including the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations. They created a project website. They had BCI two. BCIT students um, engaged in terms of taking a look at the site as part of um, their uh, project work. They offered it uh, the project site as a Green Shores uh, training field site so that we could train, uh, use it as an example for um, trainees to uh, work through for uh, the, their completion of uh, Green Shores Level 2. They also um, created some on-site permanent signage. You can see examples of, of this here, which talk about the value of, of the habitat that has been uh, created. So through that, they achieved uh, maximum, maximum points. So for a total um, out of uh, 28 possible points, this project is achieved uh, 20 points, uh, qualifying it for a Green Shores Gold rating. So let's take a look at what the project proponent uh, thought of the of the um, the project and the uh, Green Shores certification process. I think one of the things that came out when we asked uh, the project proponents about that was that they, through their independent process, had the specific goals about enhancing habitat and increased public uh, enjoyment of of nature. And when they combine that with the the Green Shores principles that I outlined earlier. It really enabled the project team to have that clear path forward for successful completion of the project. And they, when they achieved the gold rating, it really reinforced the, the positive aspects of, of the work that the, the team did and the partners delivered at this uh, park project, both for the environment and, and the community. Um, but there's no project without some challenges. Uh, the urban location of the of the uh, project proved to be uh, a bit challenging uh, in terms of um, there was a, a lot going on um, in terms of what happened at the, the park itself and um, trying to make sure that the, the project design met all that, um, all of those, um, all that input. They also had some challenges in terms of the, the year. The, the, the winter construction work, um, because it was very wet and cold, so they had some, uh, they had a lot of water to deal with and then, then poor growing conditions. And that was followed then by severe uh, summer drought conditions, which again, made it, made it uh, more challenging for, their, for those uh, plants to um, be more robust. From their perspective, some of the key uh, successes were uh, to um, this multi-partner approach with the City of Vancouver and the Parks Board and the Port, uh, and that um, was was very important. Um, they really felt that collaborating with um, the local First Nations in such a positive, progressive way was was a new new way forward, and completing this project enabled that. 
Um, being able to reopen that area of uh, Burrard Inlet uh, to tidal influence um, for the first time since the 1960s. And the good news is, is juvenile salmon are uh, using the area since they've uh, completed that. And they also um, thought that a key success was receiving both local and international rec uh, rec recognition from Green Shores and others was a real key success to the project. From the verifier's perspective, um, she really looked at that the project um, was a huge boost to the habitat diversity and, and quality and quantity. I mean, there was a significant change at the site. And in terms of a challenge, they, she recognized that the, the uh, project team really did a great job with the remediation of those contaminated soils uh, from that pre-use, uh, pre pre-park use of the site. From the process of um, verification, uh, this project, uh, the project proponents, when they pulled together their uh, documentation uh, that was really well organized and very, very clear. And I know that there was some back and forth between the Stewardship Center and um, the uh, project proponent to make sure that the documentation was, was well organized and was pulled together as needed. And uh, from the verified perspective uh, that the project uh, overview really captured the project key aspects and design elements. And those will be used to create a, a case study that will be posted on our website. So now I'd like to complete uh, my end of the presentation and uh, move on to hearing about from Kelly, a Green Chores for Homes project. So I'll leave it to Kate to switch us over. Good morning, everyone. How's the sound? Sound is pretty good. Um, a little bit louder might be slightly better. Okay, I'll, is that uh, a little bit better there? That sounds very clear. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Gigi. I'll be speaking about a Green Shores for Homes case study uh, for a very successful project on Vancouver Island located near Mariner, near Parksville. For those of you outside of British Columbia, Parksville is about uh, two and a half hours north of Victoria on the east coast of Vancouver Island, kind of close to the star there. And looking a little bit closer to the actual project site, the yellow demarks kind of the project area. It's foreshore area that spanned two adjacent properties, about 75 meters of total length of, of uh, shoreline. And some of the key features of this location in particular is that it's located adjacent to the Strait of Georgia, which is also known as the Salish Sea. And so there's some key features of uh, erosion potential from the wave action and a large fetch distance off of the Strait of Georgia. The area is also located within the Parksville Qualicum Wildlife Management Area, which has been designated since 1993 by the provincial government for conservation of coastal intertidal, estuarian, riparian habitats that are used by birds, mammals, amphibians, reptiles, and fish. And the ecosystems are considered to be regionally and internationally significant. An example of this being the eelgrass beds located offshore, about where the green is shown on the photo here. And those are key habitat for spawning, herring, sandlands, and other marine species such as uh, crab and salmon. The uh, eelgrass uh, includes both common and Japanese, and it's located about 75 to 200 meters offshore there. The objectives of the project from the landowner's point of view, there was a number of them, but some of the key ones were that they wanted to stabilize their shoreline. With the Strait of Georgia having the erosive uh, potential from winds and wave action, they wanted to protect their properties. They wanted to collaborate as neighbors so that there'd be greater shoreline lengths protected, so a win-win for more people. And cost savings uh, are very real when people do collaborate, and that's a key feature of this project. There can be anywhere from 10 to 20% savings for the landowners because there's savings in construction fees, permitting, and qualified professional assessments. They also had a, a really unique opportunity to kind of lead by example to show their other waterfront neighbors uh, what could be done with the Green Shores principles applied. They also wanted to utilize native vegetation, which has the best chance of success. Uh, there's reduced maintenance, uh, less chance of replanting, hopefully, and an increased chance of just that overall erosion control. As DG mentioned, with the coastal development project, a, a 
a well-functioning project team is key. We've been very fortunate to work with um, Ryan Christie, who is with Parksville Heavily Equipment. He's done a number of green shores projects in the area, and he had an important role in assembling the team and coordinating it and kind of working the project through to implementation. He also obtained the permitting from the Regional District of Nanaimo and Federal Department of Fisheries and Oceans. The Stewardship Centre, as DG mentioned, was also involved through project support, Green Shores documentation. There was a project plaque and certific certificate issued at the end, and the case study is posted to the website as well for anyone to take a look at. There was biological consulting provided by DR Clough. That was a key part of the project as well in that there's a construction environmental management plan that proactively looks at any risk for when the work is being done on shore, on the foreshore. Plants were supplied by streamside native plants and installed by Parksville Hilly Equipment. There was geotechnical and engineering consulting done by Lukowicz Engineering Associates. They provided kind of a baseline erosion condition assessment, which is key to get a sense of where we're trying to move from. And they also designed the foreshore protection system. And verification, again, a key part of the whole process by Harry Rogerberg and Associates. There was a preliminary or kind of an interim verification at which point uh, the proponents had an opportunity to look at for the potential for increased credits and points, and then the final project verification that gave the actual Green Tourist for Homes rating. This is what the site looks like kind of prior to any of the work being done on site. This is looking west. The shoreline is a combined, as I think I mentioned, about 75 meters total. We can see that there's some large woody debris, uh, not too much vegetation to stabilize the shoreline. And then if we notice this uh, chain link fence in the distance, this next photo looking west is closer up to that. The chain link fence isn't particularly conducive to landowners using and in, or enjoying their foreshore. And the little wooden ramp there at very least would require maintenance and looks a bit slippery. So again, improvements were made through the way this project was put together. This is looking east. We can, again, can see evidence of erosion. There's undercutting. There's also invasive species, in this case, scotch broom. And this also shows that undercutting, so there is definitely erosion taking place. The sand is indicative that there's probably lateral erosion happening along the shoreline, which is uh, damaging to everyone's properties along the shoreline, basically. The approach taken for the Mariner Wave project was to use a hybrid green shores for home soft shore design. This diagram shows kind of a side profile. The large boulders are placed into a trench and the profile is increased. So that helps to uh, combat kind of erosive power from wave action, particularly at high water events. Varying uh, diameter materials are placed onto those larger boulders and then it's capped Plantable material is added as well, so we can add vegetation, and then large woody debris is added as well. So it's called a buried revetment, and the idea is that it provides a kind of a stabilized matrix to protect the shoreline and the adjacent properties. This is what the buried revetment looks like in progress. It's a, it's a trench created at the high water mark. There's the large boulders placed in. Actually, a sediment cloth is placed first to prevent the movement of vines and then the larger materials. Then the very diameter materials are placed onto that. And finally, when it's all completed, it looks more or less like this with very diameter materials. And the center of this photo, we can see the newly created access, very low profile, fits well in with the natural environment. And this is from the vantage point of the property owners. So looking from their property out to the beach, again, very low profile, fits well in with the natural environment, aesthetically pleasing and easy to use. This is the uh, step at which the large woody debris was placed back onto site. Uh, it was salvaged and retained, the existing materials were retained and then replaced. And they're placed strategically, so this next diagram or next photo can show us how they're placed at varying angles, which is key for different wind directions, so that that erosive possibility can be combated at different wind velocities and different directions. You can see some of the larger boulders on the surface as well.
And then planting of vegetation, a very key part of the whole process. Some of the species in this diagram include the dune grass. You can kind of see it over here by the, the boulders. There's Kinnikinnik, Kinnika rose, beach pea, and coastal strawberry. And the total planted area was about 200 square meters. This photo does show the success of the vegetation, which is a key part for providing habitat for smaller amphibians, for stabilizing the soils and all the types of material. This is looking east, again, the completed project. You can see a bit better sense of the profile that is helping to combat uh, particularly those high water events. A particularly exciting feature of the Mariner Way project was that it was the first Green Shores for Home project to achieve Green Shores Level 2, which is the ORCA rating, with a total point, total of 40.5 points. ORCA requires a minimum of 40 points, of which 20 points have to come collectively from either shoreline processes and shoreline habitat credit categories. And what was particularly important about this project reaching the ORCA was, this is according to the verifier, was that there was the collaborative component and credit rating helped to move it into that category of the ORCA rating. These are some of the perspectives of landowners now that the project's in place. They said that we've received many compliments from visitors and passers-by, some of whom could not tell that any work had been done, as the berm or the red vet mong matches the natural environment so well, and no one would realize that beneath the bleach there are massive boulders providing security without an ugly and destructive seawall. Indeed, he showed some photos of some of those particularly destructive seawalls. The contractor, Ron Christie, mentioned that some landowners are concerned that a Green Tourist for Homes project will not be able to protect their properties from erosion and sea level rise. And on East Vancouver Island, we should note that there are predictions that by the year 2100, that can be as high as 0 0.8 meters. In fact, that's considered to be the minimum for potential sea level rise. So protection against that is, is important to do. He said that we've shown many times, and there are numerous other examples, that traditional, those hard seawalls do little to protect against erosion. And in fact, they can create more damage. In many cases, they're now removing traditional hard seawall and replacing them with green shores design projects with great success. From a permitting point of view, his experience has been that municipalities are generally thrilled to see that a project is enrolled in green shores for homes because they know that the project should meet or exceed all of their permit guidelines because of the underlining green tourist principles, which are based on those ecological science principles, very important part of it. And in conclusion, some very happy landowners here alongside Ryan Christie, the, the contractor. They commented that the beauty and value of our property has been preserved and enhanced. And they're standing there with their plaques. If anyone has any questions, uh, you're welcome to contact DG or on the website. And I want to thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Kelly, and thank you, DG, again. Um, we do have some questions that came in, so I'll leave it to you two to decide who will answer them. But the first one is, do the benefits of green shores accumulate over time? For example, with the green shore, or will the green shore grow at a rate that keeps up with the sea level rise? Mm -hmm. Um, I'll, I'll try to tackle that one. Uh, great question. Uh, basically, uh, as the sea level rises, uh, you, you would have to uh, amend just like in any other shore protection, um, depending on how the project is designed to, to begin with. But uh, I would imagine in most, in most cases, you, you would have to, from time to time, uh, uh, carry on with, with uh, bringing your green shores design up to um, whatever level of sea, le sea level rise that you're that you're dealing with so uh, it, it is an adaptive it can be an adaptive uh, approach to to sea level rise great thank you DG so there's another question are there any examples of green shores projects that have occurred outside of British Columbia uh, uh, yes, uh, Green Shores for Homes was um, developed in uh, collaboration with uh, the Washington State and uh, Washington Sea Grant in the city of Seattle. So we have a couple of projects. Um, they were pilot projects for Green Shores for Homes 
done in, in Washington State, and I um, believe we have three of them in, in Washington State. But the bulk uh, of Green Shores for Homes projects um, have, and Green Shores for Coastal Development projects have happened in British Columbia. We are currently looking at uh, expanding the program, and we will be having some pilot training and hopefully some uh, new projects happening in Nova Scotia around probably 2020 and, and beyond. That's really exciting. Mm -hmm. All right, so Kelly, this one is particular to your presentation. Uh, for the Green Shores Home Project, could you please share some costs with us? I actually don't have that. Uh, Didi, would you happen to have any specifics on that? Uh, no, I, I don't. But we could um, we could get back uh, to folks if uh, if they wanted to find out find out no, uh, more sure. more can... details on that. Absolutely, that sounds great. Uh, another question: Are there examples of local governments requiring green shores for homes as part of the development process? If so, how is it generally embedded? And uh, yeah, what types of items are part of it, including? potentially sustainability checklist, rezoning, development application, et cetera? I'll, I'll, uh, I'll tackle that one. Um, the, the answer is, is yes, and it, it really depends on um, what, uh, you know, which municipality you're, you're uh, speaking with and how they, how they include it, what kind of language they, they include. And I would uh, draw the, um, the person's uh, attention to the Green Shores um, bylaws and, and policies uh, document that's available on our website for, for some, some examples that was updated in uh, 2016. So there's some great uh, language that's right there. But um, I do know that uh, Green Shores principles in particular are, are mentioned in, in OCPs and to my knowledge, there is uh, it's what is uh, presented is is guidance, uh, but not requirements of green shores. So there is no requirement that a project has to do green shores, but the that is the preferred uh, policy. And in some cases, it's included in development permit areas. And again, be more than happy to share um, more specifics um, if if. Uh, if, if required, or if somebody would like a little bit more um, specific language, I, I can certainly be more than happy to connect uh, that person up with uh, somebody from a local government, a planner. Um, and I'll also note the Green Shores for Local uh, Government Working Group uh, does provide that sort of assistance and, and um, within that uh, regulatory framework um, to have those policies and, and uh, bylaws um, meet the Green Shores uh, language, whichever in whichever way that is appropriate for that community. The person who asked the question said, that's great, I'll check out the guide. Thank you, DG. Mm -hmm. um, so for the first project, DG, uh, where did the contaminated soil go? The contaminant, I don't have the specifics as to where it, uh, the, the facility itself, but it went to a remediation uh, processing, so they, it was hauled off site. Great. And how is DFO permitting handled? Dave asks this. For that, for that particular project? So the project proponent um, handled the, the specifics of the uh, DFO and all the, all the permitting that was, that was required. And um, this, uh, farther than that, other than knowing that they did it and met all the permitting, um, I would have to, again, go and find out some more specifics because I don't have that level of detail. It's not uh, required. Uh, well, the, they have to meet the permits, but I, I did not review the permits themselves. So I'd have to get more information from the project proponent on that one. Okay. And are there other fees in addition to the enrollment fee? So for, uh, as I mentioned, uh, right now, the enrollment fee for Green Shores for Homes, as well as the verification fee, is covered by project uh, funding, some grants, and uh, with thanks to the Real Estate Foundation and the Sitka Foundation, to who covers um, that, uh, that fee, those fees. Um, and um, for Green Shores for Coastal Development, 
because these are larger scale projects, there is the $300 enrollment fee, and then there is a verification fee, uh, which is based on the size of the project and the complexity of the project. So at a minimum, those fees are, are $1,500. They, they run from $1,500 to $3,500 for that, uh, the verification fee. Great. Uh, Kelly, the homeowners that did the Green Shores project, did they receive a plaque that they could post to help raise awareness with casual passerby? Uh, yes, I believe so. They uh, have their their uh, plaques, I think, posted kind of right on their shoreline, line, and when people walk by, they can see them, those, those green plaques. Lovely. Um, and when and where is the next Level 2 training course for professionals? So um, we are planning a, a level two uh, training course in uh, Vancouver for the fall of, of this year and and also possibly on Vancouver Island again it would be it would be in the fall um, probably north of, of Nanaimo um, or possibly in Nanaimo so that would uh, we had uh, one in southern Vancouver Island um, just um, uh, in the the fall of this year, so we'll be looking to go a little farther north, uh, mid 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 island, I guess I could say, Vancouver Island, and then Vancouver. Great. And do you find that you pursue other eco certification at the same time, for example, LEED? And are there opportunities to collaborate with other eco certifications? So we are collaborating with uh, Salmon Safe. Um, because that really merges well, Salmon Safe uh, certification and Green Shores will, will work really well together, and that is sort of the um, our main uh, collaboration at at this time in terms of other certification programs. Uh, one more question. One of our obstacles has been getting engineers on board. Are there specific efforts targeting engineering firms with education and awareness outreach and showing them successes? Yes, we're working with a, a, a group that's working with engineers and geoscientists VC to look at getting a, a coastal um, designation for, um, for engineers, and that would really help um, project proponents know sort of where where to go and and certainly having um, uh, working with a group of coastal engineers that we that we have on our technical advisory committee uh, to make sure that um, and EGBC is um, up to speed with what Green Shores is, is all about and um, certainly have worked with them in terms of Developing the the Green Shores Level Two training, and you know, could more work be done? Yes, but um, we are certainly um, working towards engaging all professionals to um, know about Green Shores and how it can apply to their uh, professional um, uh, the, their work in their profession. Great. So sort of along the same lines of engaging people, but are there plans, are there any plans to deliver more immediate benefits or incentives to developers for pursuing Green Shores standards? We, uh, incentives is always a, a really uh, important part of, of the equation. And uh, the challenge is, is to balance the incentives with capacity of organizations to deliver uh, those incentives. And um, right now we can offer the, the, the uh, for Green Shores for Homes, we can offer the um, project uh, certification process um, for, for free so that we can get more demonstration uh, projects out there and, and we can share the news of them well, like the Mariner Way one. And um, the other incentives we, we are looking at is our exploring the option is fast track permitting. We've heard that that is something that is, um, would really incentivize more projects happening on the ground. But as um, people can appreciate it, it takes uh, time uh, and, and, and much thought to make sure that uh, the process is, um, is, is not overly onerous on, on either the project proponents or the, the, uh, the, the local government or, or provincial government. 
So that's one of the things we are exploring right now is um, encouraging um, our local governments within our working group and any others to uh, look at look at that as a possibility. And also we are in discussions with the um, Ministry of uh, Forest Lands and Natural Resource Operations for the whether or not we can have some more specific guidance from them and possibly um, a, pr a better a process uh, for soft shore or green shores type projects, which I think will provide some incentives. Um, other incentives we've looked at, and if there's any funders out there listening, uh, we'd love to do a pilot project on um, having a uh, offering as an incentive uh, shoreline assessments and then uh, some some guidance in terms of what uh, like a, uh, a and a reporting on on what kinds of things that uh, a project proponent could do after that assessment. So that's something else we're we're looking into. But we would need to find a a funder who would would help uh, do a pilot project to that uh, to that effect. Okay, good to know. Um, so there's just a couple more questions, and we have a few more minutes, so I think we can we can get to them. If we don't get to anyone's questions, we'll follow up with email afterwards. Um, Sharon, just a note, I couldn't quite understand your question, so if you don't mind rephrasing it, and then I'll ask it um, when I get the second version. Uh, but we have one other question. Um, are there any Lakeshore projects proposed or underway in BC? Uh, yes, there's a couple on um, Okanagan Lake, uh, one uh, near Naramata. And uh, uh, similar to the Mariner Way um, project, um, they have an erosion after the big storm event, uh, I guess it was two winters ago, or actually, you know, maybe it was last winter. Um, we're not quite done with winter yet here uh, this year, are we? <laughs> and so that's underway. Um, and the, the other one is a uh, strata. So it's a green shores for coastal development. Um, project. Uh, so the one Green Shores for Homes and one uh, Green Shores for Coastal Development happening on Okanagan Lake. Awesome. And is there a list of experienced Green Shores contractors, engineers, and landscape architects? Great question. Um, so the Stewardship Centre offers uh, a, a list uh, by geographic uh, region um, of professionals who have taken the Green Shores Level 2 training. And so uh, we can provide a list of, of people who've taken the training. That does not mean that they are uh, approved professionals because um, we don't have that designation yet. Um, that's why we're working on this um, course uh, through BCIT for approved professionals. But in the meanwhile, we've got a list of people who've taken the Green Shores training and. Um, have it sorted by their professional um, designation. So uh, we are uh, available to provide that list to to folks, and they can just get in touch with me, and I can um, I can send that information along. Wonderful. Well, we're just about at 12. So thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you so much, DG and Kelly, for wonderful presentations. And anybody whose question has not been answered, I will follow up with you via email. So have a wonderful rest of your day. And uh, thank you again, DG and Kelly. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye.